Blog Talk Radio. Good evening, everybody, and hello, and welcome to Fire Engineering Talk Radio and another installment of the Professional Volunteer Fire Department. It is Tuesday, March 26th, and I'm your host for this evening, Tom Merrill. So glad to have you along this evening or listening in uh, if you choose to listen in at a later time. I'm very happy to have you with me this evening. And spring is finally springing here in the Buffalo area where I'm from. We hit 39 degrees today, maybe 40 later in the day. But when I last looked uh, driving my car, it was 39. It was bright. It was sunny. We were so excited. And maybe, just maybe tomorrow, we're going to hit 50. And gosh, if we do, I've committed myself to a nice run outside. I have not run outside since probably maybe early October. So I'm really looking forward to getting outside. And hopefully wherever you are listening in, the nice weather's coming and it's a slow process here. Last year, our fire department installation dinner was in mid-April. Ours is always in April. We install our chief officers then. And I remember in mid-April last year, we had a snow slash ice storm. So even if we get some decent weather tomorrow and later this week, we know not to get too hopeful that spring is finally here. But it felt like it today, hitting 39 degrees. And hey, March 26 means we are just under two weeks away. From FDIC 2019, which is April 8th to April 13th in Indianapolis. And gosh, I hope I can see you there. I always look forward to the show. I'm so looking forward to reconnecting with so many great friends, colleagues, mentors of mine, to continue with networking and to meet new friends and new mentors, as I do every year. And I always tell my wife when I come home, I feel like I made at least a couple hundred new friends because it is such a great experience. Not just are you learning and seeing all the new products that are available and staying on top of what's going on in our fire service and seeing the absolute rock stars of our fire service that networking is second to none and i'm just getting so fired up to to be there in two weeks and and hopefully i'll see you there hopefully i'll see you there um if if i'm lucky enough maybe you'll be in my class i'm so excited for the sixth year to be presenting my class at professional volunteer fire department and hey if you're still looking for classes to attend my class is tuesday april 9th from 1 30 to 5 30 a nice four-hour class discussing what it means to be a professional firefighter and even though it's my sixth year and i've said this on my previous shows always modifying it always tweaking it there's always new ideas there's always new thoughts I get great feedback as I travel around the country talking to firefighters. So there's always something new to talk about because our fire service, and actually our world for that matter, right, is changing, isn't it? There's no shortage of things to talk about to highlight how much everything is changing in the world and in our fire service. And, um, you know, when I talk about the changing world, um, I can't help but think about the recent example of what I saw. What was it, two weeks ago coming from California? Did you all see the incident in Anaheim, California, where the fire department had a working fire and the, there was a vehicle blocking the hydrant, so they took the window of the vehicle out to stretch their large diameter hose and hook it up to the hydrant? It, it just, to me, that illustrated the difference in our world today because we've seen photos like that before. But I've never seen the backlash that the poor Anaheim Fire Department took that I saw this time. People were darn right nasty about it, criticizing the fire department, saying that they didn't have to do it. And and I don't think we saw rebuttals like that or people lashing out like that in our recent past. And it seems to me like that's our future. We are being judged more than ever before. And boy, did Anaheim handle it so classy. That is a great example on how to handle negative press. They confronted it head on. They were very honest. They were very um, informative as to why they did what they did and how other alternatives didn't work. They didn't get nasty with the people that were getting nasty with them. They didn't try to shy away from it, didn't try to bury it under the carpet. And that is a great example of how to handle a situation 
in a professional manner. Big word we always use in the show and on my class, in my presentation, and in my articles. But again, I don't think a few years ago you were seeing the backlash when some fire departments did that. Today, we do. You know, that's the good and the bad of our world today and the good and the bad of social media. And allow me also to introduce something else I want to talk about in my class, um, always adding new things. And the last few classes I've done, I, I, it, it, I've really gotten emotional about this, and that's the trolling that is going on in social media. And the brothers and sisters of our wonderful fantastic fire service that we love to talk about about what a brotherhood and a sisterhood it is and how we have each other's back but then so many turn into keyboard warriors and they just take gratification and absolutely beating other firefighters up it's just horrible and it really upsets me and i would ask all of us as professional firefighters to take a step back and reconsider what you're typing what you're saying you can disagree with what you see or what you read about that's fine heck you can even discuss it in your group setting in the firehouse on a drill or a training night how would we do things is this how we would behave is this appropriate but to sit there and drag other people through the mud and criticize and beat and harass and it, it's just nasty and and my opinion, and I'm going to ask our guest about it in a little bit too. In my opinion, this has to stop and does not does not ex, does not exemplify the professional fire service that I want to belong to, and I know most of you want to belong to as well. So help spread that word with me that that's not being professional. It's it's just not being nice. And after all, isn't that what the great Alan Brunetini always used to say? Can we just be nice? Can we just be nice to each other? And one other thing I've added into my presentation and in my discussions and articles and has come to light recently is in some cases I'm preaching to the choir, but we're seeing a lack of interest and participation this day and age in a lot of the seminars and presentations that some of the great fire service leaders are doing as they travel the country. It just doesn't seem to me and others that I've talked to that we're getting the attendance that we used to get 10, 15, 20 years ago at our local school auditoriums or um, our fire halls, firehouses that bring in presenters. Um, and we're wondering why. Is it because there's so much available on social media today? Does the new generation think they're getting the information they need on social media and that's good enough? Um, so let's talk about that, too, with our new members about, yes, you can get, and I encourage people to go online and get information and read and stay on top of things, but there's nothing like being in the audience of a live presentation and networking with the presenters that are coming in and giving you a lot of good information. Um, yes, some of the big shows are still doing very well, but even some of the local chief shows and county shows sponsored by chief organizations and president organizations just seem to be not getting the attendance they used to get. And I think we need to talk that up with newer members as they come on board and remind other members about the importance of getting out there and going to these shows and the importance of actually networking. And it's just so important to get out there and gather the info. And not just network with the presenters either. You're networking with other comrades in the fire service, and my gosh, you might learn great ideas from them. How are they handling man and uh, people power issues? How are they rethinking their fund drive? How are they approaching their local town officials and village officials to get more funding? What are they doing for recruitment? How about retention? Oh, my gosh, there's amazing things that can be discussed over a cup of coffee or a soda at these seminars. So I've felt that important enough to work that into my presentation and my talk here with you tonight just as something I think we can concentrate on in our firehouses and uh, um, you know speaking of networking and meeting new people I think that's where I met my guest tonight last year I believe networking at FDIC I believe I stopped by the Penwell booth and that's where I first met our guest Chief Jason Hovelman sitting at the booth or standing at the booth had a great conversation with them walked away uh, uh, with a book uh, that he wrote, and um, I'm I'm pleased to introduce him tonight because I got a lot of questions for him, a lot of things that I want to talk to him about. And, hey, if anybody would like to call in, please remember, you are more than welcome to call in at 760-454-8852. 
ask any questions you want, talk about what's going on in your neck of the woods and your volunteer firehouse, ask questions of Chief Hovelman with some of the things we're going to talk about tonight. And who is this Chief Hovelman? Well, he's a new fire chief, the new sheriff in town, I guess. Uh, I believe uh, back in January he was made the chief of the Florissant Valley Fire Protection District, which is in the great state of Missouri. And I think, and he can clear it up with me when he comes on here, that I think he was sworn in back in January. He's served as a volunteer firefighter for more than 30 years, been a career firefighter as well for about 23 years. He's been published, and anyone that knows anything about our great fire service has seen his writing, seen his name. He's been published in so many fire service trade journals. He contributes to multiple blogs. Um, he's authored, as I mentioned, a couple of books we're going to talk about tonight, No Exceptions Leadership, The New Company Officer. He's got a Bachelor of Science degree in Fire Service Administration. He sat in on boards of both the International Association of Fire Service Instructors and the International Association of Fire Chiefs. He instructs all over the United States, all over Canada, and uh, I'm told he's got a real passion for teaching and mentoring our future leaders and our officers in the fire service. And gosh, I can't wait to discuss with him tonight some of his, some of his ideas, and uh, he'll be back teaching again this year at FDIC, I believe. And as I mentioned earlier, cannot emphasize enough the importance of attending, attending these trade shows and conferences, because then you'll get to meet great people like Chief Hovelman. And like I said, I think it was last year I met him, but we can clear that up when he comes on board. Let me just see. Are you with me, Chief? I'm here, and uh, that's a very generous uh, opening. I appreciate it very much. Well, we're very grateful that you could take the time out to be on our show this evening. I know we had a close call. It was about a minute before showtime. We finally made the connection. Do you want to warn people about the new phone you have and, and what we got to make sure we do? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a new iPhone and it doesn't have the typical headphone jack. The the it's got one port and you can either charge your phone with it or you can use your headset with it. And it was dead and I could do it. so I had to uh find an alternative that luckily worked. It seems to be working. I don't know how you're doing it. Don't move because it did cut out for one second. So we're gonna hold you exactly where you're sitting. <laughs> But, no, it sounds like it's working. Okay. Right. We got you. Why don't you uh, – well, thank you again for being here tonight. Um, I, was it at FDIC? I think it was FDIC last year when I first ran into you and met you. I remember sitting at the panel booth, and I think we had quite a nice discussion. Do you, do you, do you remember? I think that's where we first crossed paths. Yeah, you're correct. Um, I spent a little bit of time at the Penwell booth uh, signing the book, which was a little awkward for me. Uh, but it was nice because I got to meet some, some folks uh, like yourself and some others that uh, might not have had the opportunity to do. You know, it's always weird, uh, you know, sitting up there and, and signing a book. And um, especially when you've got folks like John Salka and all the other legends that come through there and do that. And um, it's just always awkward for me to, to do that. But, yeah, that's where we met. And it was nice. And um, it was a good time. It, it's always good like you said, the network and really get to know people. Yeah. And I, I'd say with what you've written and, and your success, both writing wise and, and your shows and everything, I'd say, I'd put you right up there with those people you deserve to be in that booth with. So um, it's excellent that, that you're there and what you're contributing. Why don't you um, tell us a little bit about your fire service journey and how you got into the fire service and where your travels have taken you. And I know you've been both volunteer and career, and I'm not sure um, where it all started. So why don't you enlighten us a little bit on how you got your start? Yeah, I started um, at the age of 13 uh, in my local volunteer fire department. My cousin, who was my idol, uh, who I really looked up to was about eight years older than me. And that's what he started doing when he was 16. And he became a career firefighter. Unfortunately, he was killed in a non-fire related accident uh, at a really young age, but I still pursued the, the profession and I uh, wanted to follow his footsteps. So at the age of 13, I became a junior firefighter in the mid eighties. And I just kept going. I that this is all I've ever wanted to do. And I've had the um, great pleasure and privilege of doing what I've dreamed of doing and, and loving it and never regretting 
you know, we all have ebbs and flows in our career, whether it's in a volunteer setting or a career setting, you know, you always go through peaks and valleys and that's normal. I think it's important for people to understand that that's, that's normal. Um, but all in all, I've never done anything different. Uh, I got my EMT license. I got my paramedic license, so got hired in St. Louis County and that's where I've been. Um, and, you know, and I've been on shift work for over 20 years. And so this, this shift to 40 hour weeks has been an adjustment for me, but, um, it's been a good, it's been a really good career. It's, um, it's been fulfilling. It's been hard. Um, it's been fun. It's also been frustrating. It's every, every, you know, thing that you can think of as far as emotions and challenges and, you know, those, those of us that are passionate, I think, and, and teach and we do the things like your radio show and we write blogs and articles. But I think people have an idea that sometimes um, the ones that they see out front uh, had, you know, really, really easy careers. And I don't mean like not hard work, but that it was always fun and it was always a good time. And that's not the case. And it shouldn't be the case. You should have those struggles and you should have those challenges and it should that's just sometimes I think, and uh, that's that means you care, and that means that you're probably doing things right. It's the in a, it's when you have the inability to get out of those times, and you let it affect your attitude, and you let it affect your approach to the job and to the profession, and how you treat others. That's when it's problematic, and that maybe um, maybe you need to shift gears a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I think you do. I think you're right. Anyone that's passionate about this is going to pretty much experience every emotion that there is throughout their fire service journey. And and Chief, right now, then, you are the chief of the Florissant Fire Protection District, correct? That's in Missouri. Um, and that, is that a combination department or a volunteer? What do you run there? Uh, yeah, so the Florissant Valley Fire Protection District is a fully career department in North St. Louis County. Um, all of St. Louis County uh, for the most part, is all paid departments. Uh, when I started to want to pursue a career, I live out in Franklin County, about an hour outside of St. Louis. There were no paid departments out here. We were all volunteer. And now a lot of those departments are combination. But once you kind of get into St. Louis County, it's hard to come back this direction. Uh, but we're about a 62-member department, three engine houses. Um, we serve about 85,000 people. We run, uh, we do run uh, live support transports. So we run about 11 to 12,000 calls a year. And if anybody's heard of Ferguson, um, we're right next door to them and just north of okay. the airport outside of the city. Yeah, Ferguson. So we stay busy. Think, uh, uh, we get. I was just going to say Ferguson. Yeah, yeah we all are yeah. familiar with Ferguson from a couple of years ago. Yeah, the five year anniversary is in August. Okay. Wow, it's been five. <laughs> uh, so, busy <laughs> know, department, right? 11, 12,000 a year, 12,000 runs a year. Yeah, yeah, and I think we figure, uh, like anywhere else, about 9,000 of those are going to be EMS calls. Uh, the rest are miscellaneous. We run about 100 working fires a year uh, with, with the holes in the ground working fires. So I'm going to – it's interesting because um, you uh, – it had to be quite a process to go from mostly volunteer to career – and and also the combination experience and in my travels and my discussions with people i find there can be a lot of conflict and um tell me a little bit about that transition there had to be some uphill battles there had to be some conflict so kind of a two-part question number one the whole process of doing that and getting the buy-in but then number two keeping peace between the career and the volunteer that sometimes can be difficult i'd like to get your take on that yeah, it was a challenge, and we started in Sullivan, which is the volunteer department that I came from. Uh, we started with a paid chief and two 40-hour members uh, in 2000, and so that was the uh, evolution of them now having three full-time shifts with three people on each shift, you know, doing shift work covered all the time uh, with the full-time chief. I've been a part-time fire marshal for over 15 years no replacement for me yet but the transition was tough and then they uh, you're exactly right probably one of the biggest challenges was that delineation uh, between paid and volunteer and 
you know, some of the challenges that are associated with that are, is a paid captain of a higher rank and does it hold more authority than a volunteer captain? Does a volunteer chief have more authority than a paid captain? And so those were some of the things that needed to be addressed. And, you know, it sounds simple on the surface that, yeah, of course, a volunteer chief is going to have more authority than a paid captain. But when you start paying people, I would argue that the combination environment is more difficult than a fully volunteer environment or a fully paid environment. I think that combination environment is much more of a challenge and has so many different moving parts that it's really difficult to lead and manage and to get people on board. The other challenge with that dynamic, uh, that, that system or format with the combination is that, you know, you still got volunteers. Well, volunteers that get to the firehouse and then get disregarded right away on a lot of calls, stop coming to the firehouse. And mm -hmm. they, we found that our volunteer ranks decreased steadily since we've gone to this combination department. And unfortunately, um, it's, it's hard. You, you can't go backwards because we needed, we needed people during the day, you know, the days of everybody working in the community they lived in and their bosses allowing them to leave during the day when the sirens went off for a fire or a vehicle accident. Those days had long passed us by. Uh, a lot of people commuted to work now. The days of primarily the man working and the mom uh, staying home, and I'm not trying to be divisive or, or, or biased by any means, but, you know, back when I started, for the most part, the, the women were at home or worked part-time jobs in town, and the men worked all day, worked a lot of night shift work, and the, the dynamic was just different. It lent itself better to people being able to volunteer, and you mix this combination thing into it, and it's, yeah, it's a huge challenge, huge challenge. And yeah. it's still, you know, we're almost 20 years into it. It's still not, you know, where we would think it would be. Right, right. Now, how did you solve the issue over who was higher ranking or who has authority over who? Is that policy driven? and and Or is there other way? How did you do that? Are you still learning? <laughs> Yeah, I'd say there's still times where um, we're learning, but by and large, it became policy driven. It was we sat down with the volunteers and we sat down with the paid members and just said, OK, hey, the, the organizational chart is the organizational chart, regardless of whether you're paid or not, um, because I mean, not, it wasn't necessarily the most experienced officer that got hired, you know, uh, and, but you've got a, a volunteer chief officer that's been there for 25 years with a lot of experience and education. They just can't leave their job to take a full time position. So that was a pretty easy thing to solve. I think there was more friction between the company officers versus the, the, the paid company officer versus the volunteer company officer. But that is shaking itself out for the most part. Every now and again, it rears its ugly head, but for the most part, that's been settled uh, just through policy and through, I think, explanation. And mm -hmm. when you look at it from a common sense standpoint, it works out. And how about respect? How about giving and earning respect, uh, mutual respect? I would imagine that has to play into it big time. Oh, yeah. You know, and that's really, you know, the, the, the organization you have when you talk about respect, uh, it, it doesn't matter. The respect doesn't care if you're a volunteer combination or paid. It's, it's the individual that knows how to treat people and uh, whether, no matter what your, your status is, paid or volunteer or, or part-time on call or whatever it is, people are going to migrate and follow those that um, treat them the best. Um, and so we have had volunteer officers that have earned the respect uh, more quickly or more ardent ardently than um, the paid the paid company officer and so that's really an individual thing that we you know you go to any organization whether it's your church club whether it's your boy scouts uh, the people who garner and earn respect it's it's quality um, it's effort it's projecting that respect back and a lot of times first. Um, and so that's really, you know, we've seen that on both ends. 
Yeah. Yeah, and and you mentioned how when you did start going to combination, it was hard to get volunteers, and you can see why. If they're not going to be respected or thought well of, paid, they're going to say, "Why should I volunteer for this?" But at the same time, there's an, there's some uh, responsibilities the volunteers need to take as well to put forth a good effort and earn that respect. So it's kind of a two way street there. It is a two-way street, and it's a balancing act on both ends, both on the side of the department and the side of the volunteer. It's, you know, it's the dilemma that everybody's facing right now is just the smallest things of, okay, paid captain, if you get on the scene of a car fire, yeah, you can handle it by yourself. But if you hear the volunteer company go in radio service, let them come. They can help mop up. They can help. You know, don't let them pull, just roll up hose, but let them be a part of the incident. Number one, you do two things. You're, you're giving them value. You're showing that that they're needed and their time is worth the effort. And so that they keep coming. The second thing is they're gaining at least a little bit of experience, um, operate the truck, handling equipment, dealing with the call. You know, sometimes it's just those little things that, that can make all the difference in the world. Um, and, And just, not treating the volunteers like a second class citizen, which I think most of the time is not done on purpose. I think it's those little things that you don't think about. Um, you, know, you know, for example, buying new gear. And from an administrative side, when you're going to invest in the gear, the first place that was looked at were the paid members. Because if you look at the numbers, they respond to more calls. There are a handful of volunteers, not anymore a handful, but a couple that had responded to as many or more calls than some of the paid folks. And that just that one little miscue stirred a big hornet's nest, you know, mm. about who's supposed to get gear, who's not supposed to get gear. It wasn't done on purpose. It was just an right. oversight. It didn't look at the call numbers for a couple of those volunteers. And so I think most of the time it's not on purpose. It's just inattention. Yeah, little things matter. Little things matter. Oh, yeah, and, little things, uh, you know, make a huge difference. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny. A um, lot of lot of information lately on our fire service sites. I know you see it. It's really big in the northeast, especially the Pennsylvania area, getting ravaged with uh, just uh, people power issues, lack of volunteers. And you keep hearing that combination departments are so the people are more and more areas are going to have to go to combination departments and right or wrong it, it might be the way to go but i got to imagine and, and were you part of this that there's got to be some funding questions you're 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 talking heck these poor volunteer departments got to run bingo or have chicken barbecues to afford a pumper or a a truck how now are these municipalities that can't give their fire departments the tools and equipment they need to begin with going to pay salaries? What what have you seen or what have you experienced where, okay, we're going to start paying some people to be at the firehouse or putting career staff on? How is it funded in these areas? Usually by tax, um, and that's a, you know, that, that's a double-edged sword too. But I think the biggest problem that I've seen with departments that have gone combination is that getting it set up in a lot of cases is the easy part and starting is the easy part, but it's the sustainability. It's the, Hey, how are we going to retain? It's not any different than retaining volunteers. If you can't pay a working salary, because initially you're going to have volunteers that want to be a paid firefighter and they're going to jump at the opportunity. But after five, 10, even 15 years of being paid well below what maybe neighboring departments are getting paid or a department that's 30 minutes away is getting paid. You're going to lose some of those members uh, quickly and frequently. And so usually that comes from a lack of long-term planning on how do we sustain this and how do we retain it's you you want to retain volunteers and you have to have a long range plan and recruitment and all that. Well, if you're going to go combination, you have to have a plan to retain those firefighters. Otherwise you're going to constantly be replacing them. it, It costs money to do that. But you also want your department to have stability in it. And I think we're, the starting point is easier. It's easier to say, okay, we're going to hire two people or three people or whatever it is. 
and we've got the tax money to do it right now, or the taxpayers say, oh, we'll get you started. But then in 10, 15 years, you don't have the, the long range planning and, and sustainability to do that without either significantly raising taxes, which, you know, not every community is okay with that. And you have right. to kind of read the political climate on how, how that's going to work for you. Yeah. Yeah. Politicians don't want to hear another about another tax or if they agree to it to get started, like you said, now five years from now, your firefighters are looking for a living wage or a decent wage, a competitive wage. And oh, by the way, we need that new fire truck or new fire gear. <laughs> and uh, then, right. then you're... And, uh, and and it's funny because it's something you don't think about is even though you go combination and pay some people, you still, in these situations, if they're not addressed properly, are going to have a retention issue. They definitely are going to have a retention issue. And typically, you know, what you'll see, we saw it here in our with our department in Sullivan, is you primarily are going to hire young, single firefighters that are – eager, engaged volunteers that want to be career firefighters. Well, when they start getting married, having families, their priorities change a little bit. Um, They don't want to work two or three jobs to be able to pay for their mortgage and a minivan that they have to haul their kids around in now. They don't, they want better insurance. They want a better pension plan when they hire, they're secure. They want all of those things that by and large combination departments struggle with, uh, at least from the experiences that I've seen. And so you have to really think about as if you're on the administrative or political side of making that push, what does 10, 15 years from now look like? You know, how do you can't just roll the dice and go, well, we'll go for a tax increase in 10 years. Um, And well, what if you don't get it? You know, what, what if you don't get it? You know, you have to plan accordingly. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it, it's definitely it, – it's easy to say the answer is to go combination and to start paying people. But there's other – a lot of other things that got to be addressed, Like, and we just covered a bunch in the last 20 minutes, between how you treat your volunteers and how you pay your career and how treat how they treat each other. And there's a lot that goes into it. It's not just like you flick a switch and, okay, we're paying some people today. That solves all the problems. <laughs> Yeah, no, and the other thing that that just human nature, and it's happened at a lot of places, you go combination, you're going to have some volunteers never come back because then they're, they didn't get hired maybe. And so, well, if I'm not good enough to be hired, I'm not good enough to volunteer either. And and it's, it's not a great attitude to have, but it's reality. You know, it, I, I know any department that's had this happen, they, they've had the same issues. I've seen people not get promoted and they walk away, you know, and they, they feel like they put and invest so much time and effort into it. And that dynamic, that separation between the, the paid and volunteer people, you know, it doesn't ha- rear its ugly head all the time, but it only takes once or twice to kind of sour the mood. A couple things at you to see if, if, if I'm looking to create a one team feeling between the, co- the career and the volunteer train together. Yes. No. Absolutely. Yeah, ab- absolutely train together. And I think I think you find um, the volunteers that you have, and I'd be willing to bet any department has them, that probably know, you probably got a handful or at least some volunteers that are highly proficient. They are maybe a great instructor or maybe they've been on that department for 40 years and all they've done is drive apparatus and they can tell you everything about pumping. I would argue that not only train together, but split up who teaches and who instructs from paid to volunteer and share that knowledge from both sides of the coin. Yeah. And, and subconsciously at the same time, you're sharing that knowledge, but you're, you're creating a team. Your, your cohesiveness, I think, would get better and the bond would grow and strengthen. Yeah, and I think I think along with that, and our department has done this in some things, our volunteer department, is that, um, like, we have a junior camp um, every summer, and it's really successful. It's a, it's a wonderful program. And uh, they junior, I don't know how many they're going to take this year, but let's just say that 30 uh, ju- junior firefighters, they come spend the week in Sullivan, at the department and they do fantastic things. 
Um, it's been recognized by our uh, Missouri Division of Fire Safety and the Fire Marshal. It's, it's a really, really good program. But that is ran, operated, organized, um, everything from, from the top down is primarily all done by volunteer members. Um, it, it, and so if you can give your volunteers responsibilities that are meaningful and have value, not just kicking something down the road, I think you, I think you show uh, what, they're, what they're worth. You show that you value them, that uh, the, them taking on that responsibility is critical to the organization, especially when it gets um, accolades and um, is well received. Um, and so that's that's been good for us. It's been good for those volunteers to to do that. Yeah, that is. I love that quote. I'm going to quote you on that. I might have it off a little bit, but give volunteers something of value to show they are valued. I love that. That's a quote. I'm quoting yeah. you. <laughs> um, All right. How about this? Volunteer walks into the firehouse. Are they accepted? by the career staff? Is it that they co-intermingle, talk, chat, hang out together? Is that frowned upon, accepted? No, they do. Um, they come to our they our paid house a lot, and they'll ride out with the paid crew. They, they have the ability to do that. Um, and, and yeah, for the most part, they are accepted. And it's like any other organization. You've got a few outliers. But I would say, by and large, they're accepted. I think, too, there's also a component on weekends or nights, there's a group of volunteers that will get together and they'll spend the night at the volunteer house. Um, and just to be together, I don't think it's a competition or that they don't like the paid crew or vice versa, but they, over the last 19 years, that dynamic has gotten much better and they'll cook they'll, The paid crew will cook. They'll have dinner with the volunteers, uh, especially the juniors. They'll come in after school. They'll ride out with the paid crew. Um, they, well, but they do have some things they have to do. They got to do homework, and and they usually make them work out if they're coming in, you know, to spend the evening or a weekend with them. But yeah, I, yeah, absolutely accept them. Yeah, and then I would imagine you have to still have. Obviously, there's training requirements for your career, but anyone that's going to step forward to be a volunteer with you, uh, they still got to meet minimum training requirements as well, right? They're, I think that would make the paid staff or the career staff a little more at ease, knowing that they're getting volunteers that are are at least training and you know trying to better themselves as much as the career staff does. Yeah, and that's been tricky. Uh, that that's been a tricky thing. You know, we we've we've gone. We've gone different directions to try to accommodate and to retain volunteers. We've tried to keep them trained. Uh, you know, for a while they had to have firefighter one and two. Then they changed it a little bit to where they had to have a certain amount of hours and an in-house program. Um, and it's a tricky thing. It's hard for a person, uh, a construction foreman, to come home from a one-hour drive working all day drives home, um, gets maybe a half an hour to get something to eat and clean up and then come to the firehouse two nights a week to get his firefighter one and two, and then to spend a number of weekends, you know, doing practical skills. Now, it's tough. It's hard to get people to do that. And and it was recognized. The one thing that, that kind of works for us, too, is that every other Tuesday, I think it's the second and fourth Tuesday, is uh, training night. And the volunteers will do, you know, come on Tuesday nights and they do training and the paid crew helps with that. And so they have an idea of everybody's skill level and, and their abilities. Yeah, that is a great challenge that is seen nationwide. And uh, one thing they've been trying in New York in our area, and I, I've heard that it's worked pretty well. And actually, we have a one of our members that it worked very well with. We had a, a single mother who joined and to get through firefighter one as a single mother and working full time is not an easy thing to do but they have now in new york done what they call blended learning where much of the of the lecture material they can get online uh they can read it and and take some testing online which then they only have to show up for the skill portions and i believe i'm 
I'm getting information secondhand now that I'm not chief but not commissioner, is that that is looked upon favorably by people who has who have time constraints and can't, as you said, go up there twice a week for firefighter one. And uh, so I believe that might be one possible helpful solution, not maybe the cure all, but when I think if we continue looking at creative ways to deal with that. It can only help because that is a common problem shared nationwide. Yeah, definitely. And I think the state of Missouri has also started in the last year or two to offer some of those blended learning opportunities, which I think is a good thing. Yeah, any, anything we can do to uh, to help lighten the load and keep people home as often as more than – than because like you said, you work all day, 10, 12-hour day, hour drive home, you're exhausted, and now you got to go – the firehouse for three hours for firefighter one, it, it, it gets tiring. It does hurt our recruitment for sure. Um, and then you mentioned something else that was key too, and I think it's important to to make the volunteers feel valued is when new equipment is being purchased, to don't forget about them when it comes to the turnout gear or, or the new boots or whatever it might be. Uh, they're part of the team. You know, you don't see the baseball team not giving the player on the bench the same uniform or the newer uh, equipment that they're getting uh, goes to everybody because it's a team. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one thing that I know a couple surrounding fire districts have um, and ours did when they bought trucks that there were, there are probably more volunteers on those committees than paid folks. And I think that that lent itself well to getting people involved and taking some pride in, you know, making a making a big contribution to the district. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Hey, I'd like to remind everybody that uh, they're listening in the Fire Engineering Talk Radio and tonight's installment of the Professional Volunteer Fire Department. And I'm so grateful to have uh, Jason Hovelman on hand uh, talking about, uh, right now we're talking about combination departments, but we're going to talk about so many other things, including his couple of books that he's written. If anybody would like to call in, anyone has questions of the chief or any wants some information on leadership or combination departments or anything, anything at all, feel free to call in 760-454-8852. And, and chief, um, I know uh, you're the chief of the Florissant Valley Fire Protection District, which, as I, we said earlier, that is a fully career department. Um, but the Sullivan Fire Protection District, is that the combination department? Or is that what that one is? That's correct, yep. That's the one okay. that I started in as a fully volunteer, and and uh, it is it is a uh, combination department now. I got you. Okay, so that's the one that's transitioning over to combination. But now you're the 40-hour-a-week chief, Monday through Friday after doing shift work. I've been doing shift work at the fire alarm office for 25 years. It gets tiring. <laughs> yes, yes. But you get used to it. Like you said, now you probably don't know what to do on a weekend. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, so, again, if anybody wants to call in, at 760-454-8852. And um, I just want to tell you that, so talk about your book here, No Exceptions Leadership. Um, I picked up a copy of it a while ago, and um, when I got to it, because I'm always reading, and when I got to this book, I think I sent you a message on uh, uh, through Facebook Messenger. I couldn't put it down. I mean, it's a, it's a great resource. It should be on every firefighter's bookshelf. Um, there's really no chapters, but it's, what, 150 pages of 100 short specific leadership tips and you know what, folks, it's not just about leadership. It's practical advice as well that you can use as a guideline. It can inspire you. It can help you navigate through some of the rough times you might be facing in your fire service career because, as the chief said, man, you're going to go through all sorts of emotions and ups and downs. That's normal with any career, and it's going to happen, especially the more passionate you are. But, my gosh, this book is so valuable to managers, officers, leaders, aspiring members in the fire service, and there's so many great tips for navigating those choppy waters you might have to deal with someday and um, a, lot of, a lot of great, insightful information. Um, and, Chief, you, 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 know, you mentioned that if, if you, you're going to have, especially the more passionate you are, you're going to go through ups and downs. But I think you lay it out right in the beginning of the book, or at some point in the book I remember reading that, you know, if, if you're going to be an officer, you're going to have to deal with adversity, struggles. 
You're going to have some challenges. You're going to even make some misstep territory, right? And if you don't want to deal with that, then don't even think about taking the promotion. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the the kind words about the book. I appreciate that. And you're you're absolutely correct. Um, the book was not really planned. Um, the the year that I wrote the book, um, I had a sur- I had some surgery and I was laid up for a couple months and. Um, I'd had people ask me off of my Facebook page, the new fire officer, um, to put all this stuff in kind of one place, all these ideas, because they would go, they'd have to search through the thread on Facebook to find different things. And so while I was laid up, I I took some of those ideas and and put them in, in, in a book and I'm not the best author editor. So there's mistakes in it and different things, but, um, the, the format, interestingly enough is from. I got the idea from a business book, a really old business book that was written, I think, in the late 60s or early 70s called Up the Organization uh, by a guy named Robert Townsend. And he did something kind of like what I did, but a little bit different. But that's where I got the idea. And I just, you know, I've read a lot of books. I'm like you. I read a lot. I listen to audio books. And I wanted to write something that was going to be uh, more of a reference type book, more of a, I'm going to flip this open and read a couple things, not a, not a book in the traditional sense that it's got chapters and paragraphs and um, a lot of technical type writing. I wanted something that just was kind of like, Hey man, I'm having a tough day. I'm going to pick this up and, and read for you. But, you know, I remember him talking about this and, and picking it up and, and, just being kind of a helpful guide, like a handbook. And, um, and so I did it and did it all on my own and the mistakes are my own. And so, but, uh, you know, it, people, people have been very kind, uh, with the, uh, the, with what they've gotten out of it. And, you know, if it helps one person, then it was, it was worth the time and effort to do. I, I, you know, it's, um, I, I liked I liked the idea behind it. Uh, it was something I would want to read, so that's kind of how I wrote it. Yeah, and like I said, I picked it up, and uh, I I liked the. Uh, it's just it's just flows. It's easy to read. I've got little sticky mark uh, page markers, and um, I think I pretty much marked every page. My wife is like, um, why don't you just not put them on because you're marking every page and she's right <laughs> but i like to put little notes at the top on the sticky mark to highlight <laughs> yeah. what it is i want to point out to myself so it, it, it's it's definitely uh uh worth any firefighter to, to invest a couple bucks in and pick it up again it's called no exceptions leadership the leadership handbook by uh, jason hovelman and um yeah, I like to say too. I like to tell my officers. Um, I I put an officer development class together for our local area, and I call it officer development, leadership, success in the volunteer firehouse. And one of the things I like to point out is, so many times we call it an appointment, or so many times we call it an election in the volunteer firehouse. And my main point with with where I'm going is, I don't care what the process is. When you become an officer, it's a promotion. Because it really is a big deal, whether it's career or volunteer, officers place, and this is on both sides of the aisle. One of the problems we have in the volunteer fire service, we forget about the administrative side. There is an administrative side or a social side to a lot of volunteer firehouses, and officers play a huge role in shaping the culture of that department, impacting morale, so it is a promotion, and as such, it should be recognized as such. And also, officers need to realize, hey, you're a big deal. There's a lot you need to be aware of. Yeah, you know, in that instance, the way you frame that discussion is it really boils down to one word, or two words, I guess, would be influence and responsibility. It has nothing to do if you're elected, if you're appointed, if it's a big long testing process or it's you submit a resume how you get there really is irrelevant once you get there it's influence and responsibility and um you you can't skirt it you can't hide from it you can't you can't disregard it you know if you're a 24 year old brand new lieutenant in an apartment of 25 people it's responsibility and influence the same way it is for 
a 32 year old captain in a 120 member paid department in an urban setting it's influence and responsibility and that's what whether you're volunteer combination or fully paid you know those it's it, simplest of terms it's obviously you know much more dynamic than that but your influence and the responsibility that you bear is huge and, and to quote you chief uh it's a great line in the book that great leaders are not made by badges they're not made by titles or the size of their office their pay grade and i added <laughs> You can add this on version in book two, uh, your SUV that, you know, we love in right, our volunteer right. firehouses, right? That, that's great. It might identify you as an officer, but guess what? You're, there's a lot more than that that's going to define you, and it's it's what you put into it, and it's what's doing what is starting out right. And you give some advice in that book, you know, for new officers and how they can start out right. Um, I think you say you don't have to know everything. It's okay. It's okay. So why don't you take you know any of the new officers out there? Maybe someone that's thinking about being an officer. How do we start them out right? I think the most important thing is character matters, um, ethics matters. Um, who you know your your character is what's going to build your reputation. Those things matter. But if you're an officer um, and you want to succeed. You need to be open and really seek out the people in your department, on your crew, at your volunteer house, wherever it is that you're an officer, you're an influencer, and a leader at. And you need to seek out the people that know things and have expertise in things that you don't. Um, don't disregard the ones that are labeled as the complainers. Um, Sometimes they've got a legitimate gripe. Now, that's for you to determine, but you want to talk to the person that's been there who um, has been an operator for 20 years and see what you can learn from them. You want to talk to the person that just maybe stepped down as an officer who was one for five years or whatever that is. But I think it's really important to understand what your limitations are and to find people that can supplement that. Um, and I'm not talking about stealing things or, or taking credit for everything, but people that are going to um, be a value to the district, to the department, to your volunteer company, um, to your house, and to the members. Uh, and that's the most important thing is that, and I like to tell people, listen, if you kind of take the attitude of when you get promoted, every, every rank higher you get promoted, uh, whether you're elected, whether it's a big testing process, doesn't matter. You get promoted, the more, the higher up you go and rank, the more people you work for. It's not the other way around. And I think if you can keep that perspective that your job is to work for them, to make sure that they're proficient, to make sure they're safe, to make sure they know what the mission of the department is, what the SOGs are, how we're going to pull this line, how we're going to throw this ladder, how this truck works this part of the neighborhood, this road out on the country lane, um, this bridge that can't hold our tanker, we got to lay dual lines through. All those things, are, those are your responsibility now. And I think uh, finding people to help you be a good officer is critical. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, another thing you point out, too, is, wait a minute, I'm an officer now. I, I still have to learn. Uh, the importance of never stopping learn heck i say even though i'm not a chief anymore and i'm getting up there in my mm -hmm. age but until i stop volunteering as a firefighter i'm going to read or educate myself almost every day about this job because it can kill you as we all know and as an officer you now double your amount of reading and, and studying and trying to get better and it's okay it's okay to say i don't know this but you can try and learn a little bit about it I think it's critical. I think it's it's mandatory. I think for us to be able to say I don't know. I think I think there's a level of humility that that makes us vulnerable in a good way to our members when we say I don't know. What do you think? I mean, there's just something about that that's genuine and that's a, and that makes you more of a peer and uh, less of a supervisor. And those moments are important. 
important. And I, so I think that that's where you start building credibility and your reputation and start earning that respect is when you have the ability to say that. Now, if you're the one that all the time, then they promoted the wrong person. But, but in, in those <laughs> moments where, yeah, you, you know, I, I don't know, but you know, what do you, you know, what do you think, you know? And I think those are important times and I think you have to take advantage of those. Yeah. Now you do say there are some things that are non-negotiable. When you're a new officer, um, when you take over, you know, there's certain rules that should be uh, non-negotiable. Do you want to, you want to tell our listeners what you mean by that? Yeah, I think when you become an officer, there has to be some things that there's just no room for. Excuses. You cannot accept excuses. Um, my chief before me would tell me, listen, say you screwed up, say it won't happen again, and then go out and fix it. Um, you know, I, I think that's a big one. Is and, and that covers a wide range of things. You know, you, you can't lie. You can't cheat. You can't steal um, you, you have to have a, a person of, of moral, uh, you know, aptitude, so to speak, you have to train, you can't be lazy. Um, you have to be able to communicate honestly and effectively. Um, and I'm being honest, people think it's an easy thing, but it's not when you have to critique somebody or give them bad news, uh, yeah. or correct them. You have to learn one of the biggest things. One of the biggest things I think as an officer is you have to learn to say no. You have to be able to say no and then hold to it. Um, you have to set expectations and hold people to them. Um, and those expectations have to be based on department mission, department policy, department guidelines, um, where your company is, what what they, they need to get better on, you know, operationally. I mean, those those things aren't negotiable. And and if I tell you to do something you need to do it. And later on, this is mostly on the fire ground, but you know, it's just some simple things that that you have to lay that out at the beginning of what you expect of them and how this is going to operate. Um, complacency cannot creep in. It's, it can't be allowed. Uh, I always tell people comfort and convenience are the, uh, the, the beginnings and uh, path to complacency. And so we continually have to make sure that we're, we're being uncomfortable in the sense that we're challenging ourselves and we're not taking the easy road out of convenience, you know, that when it's hot, when it's cold, when we don't feel like doing it, when it's easy, when it's not easy, that we still go out and do the things we need to do with our companies. Um, yeah. So those are just some things that cross my mind. Yeah. You know, integrity, it, it, it just it, sometimes you, people got to look in the mirror. People got to look in the mirror if they're not getting the results they want. And and they got to be honest with themselves, first and foremost. What can I be doing better as an officer and as a leader if, if people aren't performing? And, and you got to be honest with how you're performing and how you're showcasing this professional reputation we're talking about and doing the right things and, and integrity, 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 integrity is everything. And as an officer, Chief, aren't you being watched every second? People, it comes with the territory. People are watching how you act, how you dress, how you behave, how you treat people. Are you getting out of bed and going to the call at 3 in the morning? Are you doing your job as an officer? Again, either side of the aisle. Are you doing your? Are you taking the minutes for the department? Are you paying the bills for the department? Are you making sure the supplies are stocked up if that's your job? You are being watched, you are being judged, and people are forming an opinion about you. And it's so important to remember that and try to do the right things. And if you have integrity, no one can ever take that away from you. Yeah, if you're a member of a department, whether where it is in the country or the world, and you're a volunteer or paid firefighter, if you're a member of a fire department, the way people judge you in your association with the department is going to be how they judge that department. And so all the things that you mentioned, but how you... Do, are you at Walmart screaming and hollering at the cashier because something's not working right? Are you at the gas station? Are you flipping somebody the bird at the intersection? Are you saying inappropriate or um, it? I'll just leave it at the inappropriate things on social media. Are you 
all, all, all those things matter. All those things matter to not only your members, but to the people you serve in your community. And, you know, I was told at a really young age at my volunteer department, you're never off duty. You're never off duty. And um, I, I've made mistakes even when I was younger, um, but I can say that for the most of my mature adult life, <laughs> um, I, uh, I've lived by that. I, at least I've done my best to. And, um, you know, you mentioned earlier at the, in the introduction about the social media stuff. And, and I'm like you, I, I get so um, really sick. Uh, it, it really bothers me that so many take such license to demean, humiliate, and make others feel bad uh, in, in such a, a negative tone. And, you know, when I look at the, the fire service heroes of mine, the ones that I have the most respect for from an operational perspective and a, a leadership perspective, you never see those people commenting in those threads. Never. You never see never. It. And And I wish more people, I wish more, and a lot of the people that are saying those things and doing that on social media, they'll tell you that they have the same level of respect for these people. And I'm not going to say their names, but they're, they follow these folks. I wish they would, I wish they would follow more of their example because so many of the people that I have on the tip of my tongue right now, who have been doing this a long time, who are quote unquote legends and highly regarded from an operational standpoint and, and, from an aggressive operational standpoint and from a leadership standpoint, you don't see them making these kinds of comments on social media in any platform, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, whatever else is out there. You don't see these folks doing it. And I just wish more people would, they want to follow the example of crossing the threshold or venting the roof, which is, Hey, whatever you, I got no issue with that. But I wish they would follow the same example of them being humble, being prudent, and having some, um, I guess, patience and toleration and not getting into that realm of just down and dirty, nasty talk, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's – goes against everything that we want to stand for in a you know in a positive professional light that we want to be held under it's just it it's it, and that's why I've been seeing too much of it and that's why I had to say something at the beginning it's disheartening it, it it's sad and it's just to me it goes against everything that we preach about the great fire service and what we stand for and how we're supposedly all brothers and sisters and it's just but and it's yeah that's why I'm glad you said what you said well said because we've got to get the word out there and make people take a step back before they start hitting some of those keyboard strokes because um, it, it's just, and you're right those I know exactly who you're talking about I have my fire service legends and heroes I'm looking at a wall of photos right now in my home office and and you never ever see them attacking other brothers and sisters. Um, the way these other keyboard warriors are who are supposedly pillars of our fire service in their mind. And, uh, yeah, it's disheartening. If anyone has anything that they'd like to say on that or anything at all about what we've been talking about, please give us a call. 760-454-8852. It's fire engineering blog talk radio, the professional volunteer fire department. I'm with chief Jason Hovelman. Chief, you got just a little bit more time. I have a few more questions. How you doing on time? Are you all right? Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, because uh, a couple people have pinged into me here. Um, uh, they ask you a couple questions um, that, that they have some questions, and I've heard this before from people from time to time. And uh, it, it's uh, and I think you address it in your book. I'm just looking now because I think I saw it in there. Um, the toxic firehouse culture. When you enter a firehouse, or you see that your your firehouse is uh, is going in the direction with some from toxicity, you know, you got some, some negative Nellies in there, or some some people just doing the wrong things, and change needs to be made. 
Um, I think, yep, there it is. Um, you offer some advice in the book about making change in your firehouse, and I believe you kind of refer to it as taking a chisel to a boulder. It's going to take time, but you can do some positive things to, to start in the correct direction. Yeah, I think I think the first thing that I had to learn um, when I was going through some things like that, and it's not that you know I was given good advice and I paid attention uh, to other people's advice, um, but when you you're never going to be in the perfect firehouse, um, but it's important that you take care of you as far as your attitude and your approach and your perspective and your beliefs. Which if you're if you're in it for the right reasons, you can't allow that to affect your engagement. And it's hard. It, it, it's easy this radio show and say, do this, do that. It's hard. And it takes a lot of time. And it takes a lot of grunt work to get yourself out of bed or to get yourself, you know, out of the house when you get off work to go up to the, the volley company and, and, to, and to do training whenever it's a toxic firehouse. But if you don't, take the initiative to train or check the equipment or provide a positive spin on the profession. Okay. Uh, you, you don't have to go and beat the drum for a bad officer or a bad administration, but you also don't go out and beat the drum against it, but you come in and do you come in and, and just do what you do. And I'm and, and what I found was people will start to gravitate to that. People, and I, I think I mentioned it sometimes too, is, you know, you're going to have a small percentage that you're going to be easy to bring with you. They're going to be, they're going to buy in easy, maybe two or three, depending on the size of your organization. And because you're going to be able to influence them with your energy, hopefully with your passion, with your genuineness on wanting to do a good job and, and be a good brother or sister in the fire service. Then you're going to have some that are kind of on the fence. They get that peer pressure of wanting to be the cool kid and not, you know, and, and stay disgruntled or, or be lazy or whatever. Those people, you start picking off like a sniper. So you find the one that might be leaning a little bit towards your side of the fence and you kind of put all your resources up by bringing them in. You know, hey, can you help me with this? Hey, you know, we're, didn't you take a class a few years ago about this? Can you offer some advice? And you start kind of reining them in one at a time, this could take years. It, it could actually take years. But the biggest thing I think for anybody, no matter what fire department you're on, is if you've got that cancerous firehouse, and I was in one, um, I would go out to the truck and do some airbag training all by myself. Nobody else wanted to come do it. Um, I would do tools, for, you know, sand them off and paint them and oil them and do all that all by myself. Uh, but after a while, uh, next thing you know, somebody's standing next to you. Um, it might take weeks, it might take months for that to happen, but over time, um, you, you do start getting interest and mm -hmm. then you, things start to change. It just takes time. You know, I noticed that with me. Now you just made me think of something back to the, I'm dating myself here. When I was a young Lieutenant and then a young captain volunteer, of course, I'm talking the, um, 1986 through about 1989, 1990, when I was really getting into it, um, at many times I would be the only officer who was sanding down my tools and, and repainting them and cleaning my compartments on the rig. Whatever rig I was assigned or whatever job I was assigned, I just took it extremely seriously and looked over my shoulder and might not have had many other people around to to work with me or even be interested in taking my other officers, uh, maybe didn't want to take care of their truck the same way I did. But you know what? Eventually, and like you said, it didn't happen overnight, but eventually there were people joining who came out to the apparatus bay to see what was going on, or other officers finally started looking at what I was doing, and it, it, it sparked an interest in them, and then we started working together. And before, it did take time, but eventually I had a group of like-minded officers who were passionate and driven to do the job right. You can't just snap your fingers. You can't just ask people once. You can't just expect them to do it. But sometimes leading by your own example over a period of time can pay huge dividends. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah.
I, there's no doubt about it. It does work. It does work. But and it, it, like you said, the time period is going to be different for everybody. Yeah, and that's why you got that great line about taking a chisel to a boulder. And uh, you also say, you know, don't sit around complaining about the problem because if you're doing that, then you're part of the problem. Because it's the easiest thing to do <laughs> for for all of us. <laughs> it's easy it to sit on the it front is. bumper and complain, or it's easy to sit at the kitchen table and complain, or uh, especially when we're around our buddies. And sometimes sometimes our buddies aren't on the same page as us. I found that too. You know, sometimes my best friends weren't. We were like minded in that we loved being there, but they weren't. They weren't like minded in that they were bolder. You know, uh, all the time. And so sometimes you gotta you, you kind of gotta push away from that a little bit um, at the firehouse. But yeah, I, I think it, it's it's it takes effort to fix these things, and so just to sit and complain um, is counterproductive. It's more of okay, vent a little bit, you know, you can express your manner, but what are you going to do to fix it? You know, yeah. if nobody's doing anything about it, and that's usually the complaint, well, then find a way to fix it. And, you know, some things are out of your control. You know, if it's if higher pay grade and, and there's absolutely no way for you to actively do something, then at that point, you just have to say, okay, hey, listen, I'm going to write this thing down. Uh, when the time comes that I've got enough influence and political capital or authority, then we'll address it. But at some point, you can only control what you can control. Yeah, yeah. You know, I've, I've again, I've told our listeners and listeners again, you're going to want to pick up a copy of this book because there's just so many great lines and quotes and things that really stick with you. Another one that really it's another one of my favorites and I think I made a Facebook post on it. Sorry. I gave you full credit for it. Of course I would never plagiarize, but it's a great line. Laziness breeds doubt. Don't be lazy. Oh my gosh. That is so true. If you are labeled lazy, it's going to stick with you for a long time. Laziness breeds doubt in your troops. Yeah, it does. It, it breeds People are going to doubt your abilities. They're going to doubt your engagement. They're going to doubt your knowledge. I mean, everything about you if you're lazy. Um, and, and you know, I think you can take a look at an example is, you know, when I was a captain and we would do hands-on drills before I was a captain, I always noticed that some of the, some of the more, and it's not always this most senior officer, but I noticed a lot of senior officers would go, hey, hey, what? Let so and so do this drill I've done before. Let so and so, and when that happens every month, every drill, you start to question. Now wait a minute, does this guy really know what he's doing? And so it, it, it puts doubt in their mind. But I'll tell you who else has doubt is in not wanting to step up and do the drill and go first. There's doubt in that person's mind, and if that officer has doubt of his own abilities or her abilities and doesn't want to be vulnerable in front of their company, it's going to create more doubt from the members. And um, yeah. when I was a captain, a company officer, the one thing I did, hands-on drills, I went first with the most junior member every time. And it, it accomplished two things for me. It put me um, on the spotlight first. So if anybody was going to screw up first, it was going to be me. If anybody was going to fumble it first, it was going to be me. If anybody was going to made fun of first it was going to be me but what it did for me is it made me have to stay proficient but then what it also did is it showed everybody else hey he's willing to do it you know okay we're gonna we're, we're all in this together but it also gave me an opportunity to work with a junior person and one of the byproducts of that was that down the road as this went on and it became not as big of a deal i'd have other members of my company that wanted to go first with a new person and so it worked out pretty good you know you're building credibility too you're building credibility you're mm -hmm. you're enhancing your own reputation which right or wrong, it's so important especially in the volunteer firehouse you want to build your credibility and you i think you even say don't apologize for having your for your passion don't apologize be passionate you know passion is so important nobody likes leaders or officers that aren't passionate and into the job Yeah, no, absolutely. Don't. There's no reason to apologize for for being passionate and and being excited about coming to work. Um, you know, and everybody expresses that in different ways. I think as long as you're not 
you know, I, I kind of relate it to people that promote past others. Uh, there's nothing wrong with, because you get to say, you know, well, you're just doing that because you want to get promoted. Well, I'm not doing it just because I want to, but I am taking steps to uh, afford myself that opportunity. And I think, and I don't remember who said this, it's not my mind, but it's something that has always stuck with me. It's like, listen, you're going to climb the ladder of success um, and you can climb it one of two ways. You can step on people as you go up the ladder or you can politely climb around them and on the spaces in between their hands and, and, you know, and leave them unscathed. But, you know, if you start putting your foot on their nose and on their shoulders and in the middle of their back, that's when you start having problems. And so yeah. I think that engagement and excitement is the same way. You know, you, you can rub it, you can rub it in their face and really be in their face, or you can just be genuinely excited about coming to work. That's great advice. That's absolutely fantastic. Absolutely great. And I like to tell people too, I used to tell them, you know, building their credibility and, and do and treating people right and climbing the ladder of success the right way. You know, and I say, you know, be the officer, engaged, productive, and doing what is expected. And when you do that, you're going to be tired. And I used to tell my officers all the time, officers that are engaged are tired. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was just in South Carolina for three days uh, teaching, and we talked about how the most – you, you know officers that are doing their job and that are meeting and exceeding expectations are the ones that end up every shift – whether they ran a bunch of calls or not, yeah. they're, they're always yeah. doing something and they're just, and they're always mm-hmm. tired at the end of the shift. Always. Yeah. Yep. I, both I learned that on my own. I couldn't figure out why I was tired of them. Yep. Oh and, yeah. And, and, it and, doesn't matter if you're volunteer or paid. If, yeah. And also on the administrator side or, uh, or the fire medic line officer side. Uh, anyone listening that's a volunteer, board of director, treasurer, secretary, it applies to you too. You can be passionate about that job, and you should be because you took it. And you want to demonstrate competence and enthusiasm and, and build your credibility the same way. Hey, Chief, um, there's so much more I could talk to you about, but real quick, I want to just have you summarize your other book that you wrote. Uh, you did write a great book, The New Company Officer. And I, if you want to tell our listeners a little bit about that, I mean, you got some great information in there about firefighters and, and why they make bad decisions on and off duty. How can they deal with their own personal problems? So, gosh, tell us a little bit about this other book because it's another uh, book that our li- listeners should probably want to look up and add to their collection. Yeah, that was something that I did write on purpose. I did plan. <laughs> uh, it's it's a short book. It's not very long, but I. I uh, I wrote that book based on a lot of the classes that I teach, and the the primary goal of that book was to offer new company officers, although there's I think value in it for existing company officers and and any firefighter I think that that wants to um, advance or be attractive candidates uh, for their company officers or just be a, a strong influence in the firehouse, but. What I tried to do with that book was give tangible uh, things that you can use straight straight from the pages. Um, it, it wasn't. I, I tried to avoid a lot of stories about, um, you know, feel good, rah rah kind of stories. Uh, those, those all have their places, but I really wanted to offer things that people could really do and take off the pages, like setting expectations, um, like. Um, how to handle difficult members, um, how to do discipline and, and delegate and set goals. And so that was my, that was my goal and objective behind that. And I really wanted to keep it concise and short, which I think I did. Um, but that, that was kind of where it came from a lot of, uh, from personal experiences, uh, both in success and in failure. Yeah. And you, you, say it so well in there that you know we do an excellent job in a lot of cases when it comes to the the operation side of things pulling hose throwing ladders but what do we do every single day right we deal with people right and we don't always do such a good job of dealing with people and as you said setting expectations and following through and listening and being humble and all that and I I think it's important again as an officer as a leader to sit back look in the mirror see how you're doing in those departments see where you can improve and 
and, and genuinely connect with your membership. And uh, and, and there's going to be the naysay. Let me just – we're going to end soon because I don't want to keep you too much longer. But let me put you on the spot if I could because this question comes up a lot. Well, I've tried all that, and I've got this one person or these three or four members that just – don't get it or they're a thorn in my side so i know some of the advice you do give is dealing with difficult members what is your advice as a gung-ho passionate driven officer who's trying to mold a crew and try to offer them respect and puts time in working on drills or is working around the firehouse doing what's expected of him or her how do we get to those people that maybe are the problem member Yeah, I think, um, and I can speak from some personal experiences, is the, um, you have to build a personal relationship with those people. And I don't mean that you go to barbecues together and you do things off duty, but you have to figure out who they are. And in that, they have to figure out who you are, uh, because there's going to be misconceptions from both sides about what this person thinks, what you think, and vice versa. And you need to, you need to first thing, you need to try to build a relationship on a personal level with those people. Um, you know, we can, we can make them drill. We can make them go to calls. We can make them do things from a policy in SOG, but that doesn't make them good productive members. It doesn't make them easy to work with. And so the only way to do that really is to, to build that relationship on a personal and, and find a way to, um, I guess, show that you value uh, their, whatever it is they offer, peace, whatever, even if it's just time on the job, if it's time in that firehouse, if it's, if they're, if they're paying in the side on a volunteer department, they're showing up, you know, and so, Give them credit for that and try to build those personal relationships At, over a certain amount of time. And I don't, I don't, I don't specify what that time is, but there does come a time to where you stop putting efforts into bringing them over, so to speak, because then what you're doing is you're taking away time of mentoring, molding, and nurturing the people that do want to be there, that do want to learn, that do want to. Uh, be productive and and valuable and want to maybe be officers. And so you don't take away their opportunity to to be a part of the crew. You don't shun them. You don't leave them out. But you, you at some point, you just don't put a lot of extra into it. Uh, and sometimes that's the wake-up call that they get. And sometimes they just spend their entire career mad and unhappy and doing as, as little as possible. Yeah, yeah. All good advice, Chief. All good advice. It's easy to see why you've written a couple books. And um, um, am I correct in saying you just got appointed Chief uh, 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 back in January? Was it that I see in Florissant? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, my chief retired. Um, he was fantastic, um, Scott Seppel. Um, uh, I'll never forget. It was I think it was September fourth. Uh, he texted to all the battalion chiefs saying he was retiring. It was a surprise, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. but he, he went out on top. He went out on his own terms. He's, he was a great chief. Um, I hated to see him go. And so January 3rd, um, I slid into the office with him for a transition period. Um, and his last day in the office was February 21st. He's out on the Appalachian trail, which was his dream. And, um, he's, uh, he, he's he's sorely missed. He was a great chief. Um, learned a lot from him. And uh, but I'm happy to be doing what I'm doing. It's a little bit of a transition for me after being on the on the shift for so long, and being really hands on and operational. That's been a a challenge for me too to kind of feel myself out. But mm -hmm. um, it, it's it's good. It's a little earlier in my career than I expected it to be, but. Um, it's good. I got a great department that I inherited from him, and I'm very fortunate and privileged to have the opportunity to work for uh, the members that we have there. Did I see too that you, that did is it, did he get to ride home on the apparatus on his last shift? That I wasn't that posted to, or was that something else I saw? I thought I saw that he was yeah he got a send off. He did. He 
he uh, the the day of his party, which was February 21st, uh, the the firehouse and huge attendance. He was very well respected and, and well liked uh, for not just being a fire chief, but a great person. And so when he was ready to go home that day, uh, they put him on the truck and and drove him home. Yeah, it was pretty neat. It was a it was a pretty emotional time. That's awesome. Yeah, that is. Uh... That was pretty cool. I did see that. I did see that video um, on Facebook. And um, hey, you know, one thing I didn't talk much about it. If, if somebody wants to get a hold of you because you do offer so much, talk a little bit. You have a blog, talk radio show as well, and in posts, and you're a contributing author to Fire Engineering. So you, you've got a lot to offer. So number one, if somebody wanted to get a hold of you for more information, how do they do it? And, and talk a little bit about your podcast. Because you do got a lot to offer. Well, well, thank you. Um, The easiest way that you can email me at jholvelman at gmail.com or at enginehousetraining at gmail.com. That's a company that I'm a co-owner of, and that's the podcast that we do on Fire Engineering uh, Block Talk Radio. Coincidentally, tomorrow night is our night. I won't be on, but um, a couple of our other members are going to be on there tomorrow night. You can also look for me on Facebook, uh, my personal account, or uh, kind of the one that spawned a lot of this officer development stuff uh, several years ago is uh, the new fire officer on Facebook. It's a Facebook group. It's open to anybody that wants to join. We've got 26,000 members. And uh, a lot of these little nuggets that you hear us talking about or classes or whatever get posted on there. And uh, I'll also be at FDIC Monday morning. Um, funny thing is this year I'm doing a tactics class. <laughs> so, uh, but I'd love to see you. Awesome. That's great. And uh, before you go, I'm going to put you on the spot again. And if if you need to, it's page 35 of your no exceptions leadership. Why don't you leave our listeners a little bit with your uh, be the first list that you put in the book? Because I, th- I found that to be just Awesome. If you want to cover some of the be first to, um, for our members to recognize, it's not about you in the sense that you put yourself above others. It's about what you do first. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I get a lot of emails and uh, text messages and people in my department that were uh, at, you know, Hey, what do I do to get promoted? What do I need to do to get promoted? Or how do I get first on the promotion list is kind of how this thing started. And, you know, it, it boils down to building a full, consistent body of work over a long period of time. And I think somewhere in the book, I might even mention that, you know, you have to crane for a promotion. And if you're the one handing down the promotions, you should pay close attention to the ones that do cram because they're probably not the ones you want. And not always, but but you want folks that are first to get up and do dishes. They're first to get out to the truck and check the equipment. They're the first ones to help do a task or do a hard job or project. They're the first ones to help teach a class. They're the first ones to ask a question about a drill or a call. Uh, They're the first ones to offer advice when a junior member is struggling. They're the first ones to, to do a drill. They're the first ones to, um, you know, all the little things, you know, they'll step up and take on the jobs that are hard and that nobody else wants to do. They're the first ones to pull the hose off the truck when it doesn't look like it's packed right and repack it. They're the first ones to clean something up. They're the first ones to stop an inappropriate conversation at the dinner table. They're the first ones to pull a peer aside and say, hey, you need to step your game up. And and basically, you know, those kinds of situations are uh, cultural and that you want the decisions made and problems solved at the lowest level possible. And so th- those are some of the first that really are going to show somebody's ability and potential for being a good company officer. Um, that's the kinds of stuff, that's the kinds of things that in my experience, that's the initiative, that's the uh, integrity, the character, the, responsibility, accountability. They're the first ones to admit when they screw up. They're the first ones to take the blame when it's their blame. They're the first ones to say, hey, this was my fault. And then the first ones to give credit to somebody else. And those are all firsts that I think a good 
possesses and demonstrates day in and day out way before the promotion is posted or the election happens or the appointment takes place. And as we end tonight, what a first step also in being a professional fire officer and firefighter as well. Fantastic. Chief, I can't thank you enough for your time. Um, I know how crazy your schedule is. I'm really looking forward to seeing you at FDIC. I hope we could sit down, have a cup of coffee, and uh, commiserate some more. But I, I appreciate your friendship and your time and, uh, and, and you being here with us tonight. Oh, the privilege and, and pleasure has been all mine. I can't tell you how much I appreciate the opportunity to come on and, and talk to you and talk to your audience. And we definitely, um, we did it last year. We set up a little coffee morning um, at one of the hotels across from the convention center. We'll have to do the same thing. Absolutely. I look forward to it. And uh, thank you very much for being here. Much, much appreciated, Chief. My pleasure. Thanks so much. And uh, um, I look forward to seeing you. Make sure uh, you catch up with me. I'd love to sit down and talk to you. Like you said, get a cup of coffee. And, and um, you know, all the listeners and the people that go to FDIC, you know, definitely take advantage of the opportunity to run into people like Tom and, and all the others that do the radio show and um, pick their brain, get their phone numbers, get their emails and stay in touch. They, I've never ran into anybody that wasn't willing to offer help and guidance and assistance in all the years I've gone to FDIC, no matter who they are. Absolutely. So important, the networking and the camaraderie, the brother and sisterhood. Alive and well at FDIC, and everyone comes home recharged and refreshed. So you're, you are so right, Chief. Thank you again. All right. Thanks. Good night. You take care, Chief. And uh, my gosh, just I could go on and on. Um, again, p folks, the two books uh, that are must-haves for your bookshelf, uh, No Exceptions, Leadership, The Leadership Handbook by Jason Hovelman, as well as his book, The New Company Officer, um, loaded with great information. Not Again, I know they seem to be towards officers, but it's for anybody um, in our fire service. Just so, so much great information. And I, I want to thank you for being here tonight. Um, and as we end, um, I'd like to remind everybody listening, again, that part of the professional equation, part of being a professional firefighter is remembering and honoring those who have paid the ultimate sacrifice, not just firefighters, it's also the citizens we are sworn to protect who have died or been horribly injured by our enemy fire. And uh, hopefully if any good comes from these tragedies, it's the tragedies of yesteryear, it's by taking the steps necessary to maybe prevent them from happening again and remembering the legacy left behind the wall by all those who, uh, who perished. Um, 27 years ago yesterday, 87 people were killed at the Happy Land Social Club fire, which was in the Bronx. Uh, it was March 25th, 1990. It was actually a mass murder. And uh, 27 years ago, 87 people were, were killed. Um, yesterday was also the 118th anniversary of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire, which was March 25th, 1911. Um, I'm sorry, it was the 108th anniversary. My math wasn't so good there. <laughs> 108th anniversary of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire, but that should be a fire that resonates with all professional firefighters everywhere. You know, that's the fire that caused the death of 146 garment workers and they were mostly young Jewish and Italian immigrant women. Matter of fact, it was 123 women and only 23 men killed in that fire. The oldest victim was only 43. The youngest was 14. And the majority of the victims were between the ages of 14 and, and 23. It was a uh, fire, again, that every firefighter should know about. Trapped workers had to jump to their deaths. It was a tragedy that was made worse by doors that were locked that led to stairwells and led to exits. It was a common practice back then because it was they didn't want workers to sneak out on unauthorized breaks or to steal from them. Um, so if there is any good from such a tragic fire, I guess we can look at the improved conditions we have in the workplace today, the improved safety and working conditions that we take for granted today, a lot of which came out of tragedies such as the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. 
Today is also a tragic anniversary. Um, line of duty deaths of the two Boston firefighters, Lieutenant Edward Walsh, age 43, and Firefighter Michael Kennedy, who was only 33, killed in 2014, five years ago today, in a basement fire. They became cut off and trapped um, when the fire cut off their exits. Horrible, horrible sacrifice. I don't know if anyone saw uh, the postings this weekend, uh, just this past Saturday, uh, March 23rd, marked the one-year anniversary of the death of FDNY Lieutenant Michael Davidson, who was killed at a fire on a movie set in Harlem. The plaque dedication was over the weekend at Engine 69 and Ladder 28, his his firehouse. Very moving uh, video of that. Uh, you see his wife deliver an unbelievable um, not eulogy, but just an unbelievable remembrance to, to Lieutenant David Davidson, her husband. You see his four beautiful children standing there in attendance. She described uh, just she delivered just unbelievably powerful words describing who he was, his love of the firehouse, his love of the fire service, his love of his fellow firefighters, and obviously his love for his family. The list goes on. And all I'm saying is, professional firefighters, we must never forget these sacrifices of both civilians and firefighters. And if we can take any comfort at all, any comfort, it's hopefully by remembering those people, who they were, the names, because names mentioned truly never die, for they are remembered and we honor their sacrifice in this way. And by studying what happened, maybe we can pass on some of the lessons learned so it doesn't happen in our firehouse and making our fire service and maybe your own department and our professional fire service just a little bit better, a little bit safer, and the public we serve just a little bit safer because of those who came before and sacrificed all. Folks, my next show possibly will be from the FDIC show. Um, I don't have a date yet because the one day it was scheduled for is when I will be in a class. So I'm trying to work on that. But my next show outside of FDIC, Tuesday, May 7th, I hope you can make plans to be at FDIC again from April 8th to the 13th. I promise you, you won't be disappointed. Please check out my Professional Volunteer Fire Department Facebook page and give it a like. I'm always posting articles and information that can hopefully make you a better firefighter, me a better firefighter. We can learn from each other. And as we finish tonight, I haven't done this in the last couple shows. I do have a shout-out every now and then. And uh, most shows, I give a shout-out to a volunteer fire department or a volunteer firefighter. And tonight, I'd like to honor volunteer firefighter John Corman, 92 years of age, from Wayne, New Jersey, from the Preakness Fire Company Number 4, who just a short time ago celebrated 75 years of service as a volunteer firefighter. He joined in 1944 at age age 18. He joined the Hawthorne Fire Department in New Jersey. They lowered the age to 18. It normally was 21, but because it was World War II and so many men were away fighting, they needed members, so they lowered it to 18 and he joined. He eventually ends up in the Preakness Fire Company Number 4, in Wayne, New Jersey. He's a past chief. He served two terms as a commissioner, and he still serves today. He's a fixture at the firehouse. He might not respond to calls anymore, but he still attends meetings. He attends drills, and he pitches in wherever and whenever needed. And he very humbly says, Firefighter John Corman at age 92, it kind of gets in your blood, Firefighter John Corman. And here's to many more successful years on top of your 75 already as a volunteer firefighter. Folks, thanks for tuning in tonight. Wherever you happen to be, please stay safe. And please remember that developing and upholding a professional reputation is the duty and the responsibility of all firefighters, paid or volunteer. Take care, everybody.